What is going on you guys and welcome back to another video. Dad, what's going on? It's good to be back on another joint video together. It is. It's been a while since we got a chance to do one of these joint videos, Brad. I'm looking forward to this one. I'm really looking forward to this one as well. And essentially concept of this video, we've done some stuff sim similarly in the past, essentially, you know, building mock portfolios to highlight the differences between an older investor such as yourself uh, and then a younger investor such as myself, a millennial, like arguably Gen Z. I, I'm technically not a Gen Z, as you know, um, thank God. But um, <laughs> yeah, we wanted to showcase that, but actually dive in as particularly on the dividend topic. Mm -hmm. And I wanna thank our sponsor, BMO ETFs, uh, Division of BMO Global Asset Management. We figured we'd use a couple of their funds to highlight that difference and speak on essentially the things I would look at uh, in using a fund such as this for my investments, and if, you know what, what maybe you would consider someone in that older demographic would would consider. That's essentially what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I feel that dividend style of investing is suitable for all ages, but okay. definitely, and we're going to cover this today. There are some different reasons that someone like myself would use it as compared to a younger person. But yeah, we're gonna think we're gonna bust those open today and get into those particulars. We will bust those open. So if you guys enjoyed, give us a <laughs> thumbs up. Uh, leave us a comment down below what you think. And uh, yeah, I hope I'm able to uh, educate as well because you do hear a lot in particular about younger invest uh, younger investors don't like you know dividends. You hear that mm. oh you're too young, you don't need that. And that's just something yeah, I yeah. personally, on a personal opinion, um, I don't agree with. But uh, hopefully, my, my justification today will, will be a reason why. But anyways, um, I'll kind of kick things off here. And essentially, the, the fund that I'm going to select today to be used as kind of a proxy that we'll talk about, I'm going with the classic ZDV. Okay, so ZDV is the BMO Canadian Dividend ETF. This is such a popular ETF uh, for Canadians that are looking for this exposure. It's a medium risk fund. There's essentially about a billion dollars in net assets that is invested in this fund. You're looking at an MER of just shy of 40 basis points, so 0 0.39, which is very fair in my opinion to get an ETF, uh, essentially a, a passive product that does, you know, gets your diversification for you, as I will touch on in a second. And the yield today, this is a dividend fund. So of course, we're looking at a nice juicy yield at 4.23%. Uh, this fund, as with many funds that you'll come across out there, they pay monthly distributions. And to maybe like just speak on just conceptually, Dad, like, why I think um, a dividend fund may be very, very suitable for someone such as myself. When people think of dividends, they tend to think about income, but there is absolutely the potential for long-term. There's long-term growth potential at play, especially when you're looking at uh, you know uh, these high quality assets like the Canadian dividend funds, an American fund, we're focusing in on Canada today. But essentially like, People will often think, oh, if, uh, if I'm young, I need to go with the high growth tech stocks, right? That's like just what people mm -hmm. get drawn into. What I believe the Canadian dividend stocks do is they provide consistent and essentially these more or less reliable returns over the long term. And although as a young investor, you may not need that income today, like you're not going to be drawing the income to go pay for things. Some people may, and that's obviously a perk of having that income stream. What younger investors can do is they can benefit from the essentially the compounding if they are to reinvest those dividends, go buy more shares of these ETFs or just deploy them back into their portfolio. That compound growth can go a long way when you're talking about wealth accumulation over time. Uh, another thing which is obviously a massive benefit of uh, many ETFs, particularly the ones we're talking about today, is just, you know, risk diversification, right? And when you're a new investor and you're deciding, well, how do I want to build my portfolio or what am I going to buy? You could go out and buy one stock, maybe two stocks and just pick your favorites. But then there's a lot of concentrated risk in those areas, even if it is a great stock, right? We can all agree, like even the greatest of stocks, some stuff does happen. And essentially when you hold an ETF or a basket, as I always like to say, that, that essentially has a diversified mix of stocks within that basket. Again, looking at high quality Canadian dividend, dividend stocks, nonetheless, it helps you spread that risk and it essentially would like reduce the impact um, if let's say a single company or a couple companies mm -hmm. in this basket, if they had poor performance, it's essentially mitigated because you have a basket of stocks, right? Now, ZDV, as we'll look at, uh, actually, we can just pull it up right now. It has exposure to the sectors that pay higher dividends, right? We'll see an emphasis here on like the financials, um, energy, obviously here in Canada, two of the biggest um, parts of our economy and two sectors that are known, they have a history of paying attractive dividends. And they also provide good growth prospects. So, you know, you've done a million videos on the Canadian banks, dad, and just how um, it's a great mix of growth um, and dividends. 
but uh, that's essentially the, the breakdown. Of course, you can see on this page, you know, you do have exposure to a bunch of other sectors. But in my opinion, these are really two of the highlights. And I think that's very common of what you'd see uh, when you're investing in Canada. These ETFs are such a convenient way to get exposure to, a mar to the market without needing to like extensively research it and actively manage the portfolio. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you ever want to go out and buy something without researching. That's far from what I'm saying. But essentially, the, these passive approaches, especially for younger investors who may be, um, let's say, less experienced, um, mm -hmm. They may have less time to like devote to the markets or maybe they just they're busy with life, right? Trying to get a career or whatever. You can essentially park your money into a passive uh, vehicle like this. Know you're diversified and uh, carry on with your life. Three more points here that I want to call out before I'll essentially hand it over to you, dad. I just think there is flat out like touching similar to, you know, topic number one, like the opportunity for returns here is absolutely in play, right? So dividend stocks has already talked about they're providing that steady stream of cash flow. I mean, this fund, you're already getting a 4% yield, which is great. But as I mentioned for a younger investor, maybe we don't have that need for it. You're still getting the capital appreciation over time. And in fact, I'll throw up a chart just of the overall, let's say, returns of this fund since inception back in 2011. This fund has returned an average of 6.87%. So let's call that just shy of 7%, which is really right in line with the Canadian market. That's what you'd expect. You know, you do hear that like often when you're hearing about returns, you think the S&P 500, you hear this like 7 to 8%. Some people say 10%, you know, whether mm. they're factoring inflation or not. And the reality is you look back at the history, the track record, the, the U.S. market does perform stronger, you know, than the Canadian market. Right? Smaller market. We already know this. We talked about it a million times. But what I'm trying to get at is this fund is pretty much right in line with the Canadian market. It's pretty much what it's set out to achieve. And what I would personally do is if I were constructing my portfolio, you know, maybe complementing this fund up with some exposure to the mm -hmm. US, right? Because here we're focusing in on the BMO Canadian dividend ETF, ZDV. Doesn't mean you just have to have one port, you know, one fund in your portfolio. You could absolutely mm -hmm. have a mix. And personally, that's probably, you know, the, the approach that I would take. But um, what I was getting at was essentially you, you have the opportunity for both types of returns, right? Uh, which I think is just great. And again, you have the choice of reinvesting those dividends. Dividend stocks and uh, dividend ETFs, uh, the dividend ETF like this does typically uh, showcase lower volatility. So they tend to be less volatile than, volatile than non-dividend uh, paying stocks. Because when you think about it, if the stock's paying a dividend by nature, that's probably more of an established company, right? With stable cash flows. You're not getting dividends from your like, you know, young, you know, tech companies. They don't have the cash or in many cases earnings um, to pay a dividend. So, you know, the, while I do agree, like younger investors sometimes aren't concerned about volatility, especially if you're like a new investor, right? Like you're, you're, you're new to the market. I think it's always uh, not a bad idea to like find that baseline first of what you feel comfortable with rather than like, you know, jumping into the deep end and then realizing, oh, this is way too much for me. So I think this is very suitable. Last but not least, just touch on very briefly, you do have an element of, uh, of an inflation hedge, right? And as you know, dad, like dividend payments, they don't just stay stagnant they often grow yeah. over time, uh, right? Like we've, we've made the analogy to like rental income, right? If you have a rental property and you can increase the rent, you can notch it up a little bit every year. Well, dividend mm -hmm. payments do very much the same thing, right? As companies are growing and continuing to succeed, they'll increase that dividend over time, which is one of my per like personal favorite ways to invest is a dividend growth strategy. Um, this does help protect essentially against the erosion of purchasing power of inflation. So I would just say like, these are all the things that I consider when, when you know, Looking at a, a when, when you hear the argument for or against dividend stocks, there's many, many, many benefits to it. And a fund like this, I mean, essentially, you're getting access to really 51 holdings as of today. Like I said, nearly a billion dollars in assets in the fund. It's 100% weighted to equities. You want exposure to the stock market. You're looking for Canadian, Canadian stocks. You're looking essentially at some of the top uh, Canadian payers out there. Such a safe, stable core fund to consider, right? If you're looking for that baseline, like I'm new to investing, I'm a millennial, I'm a Gen Z, I like the idea of dividends, where can I get started? ZDV, I think is certainly one to put on your your little radar, um, do additional research, and we can include links below to go, you know, for you to go explore for yourself. But it's hopefully I've provided a nice little outline of what, what you're getting exposure to. Well, I think you covered off a lot of points there. And uh, yeah, kind of uh, the Coles Notes version of why a dividend fund are so popular because let's face it they're probably well probably the most popular way across the board of, of investing i mean obviously in the more recent times 
these crazy growth numbers that we've been seeing coming out have attracted a lot of the money. Uh, it does remind me a lot of, uh, well, many years ago now, I guess, throwing my age, but leading up to the, up to you know the the two thousands when when the internet was really becoming a thing. You know, just like you know AI is really becoming a thing now. So we're seeing all kinds of money flowing there. But um, yeah. dividend income dividend companies aren't going anywhere. So. Yeah, I want to, um, you know, I want to sort of ex just talk a little bit, Brad, about how someone like myself who's, you know, near or in retirement uh, would utilize dividend funds. And there's a couple of things you talked about right at the outset that I agree are totally applicable, maybe for slightly different reasons, whether you're 30 or whether you're 60. But you talked about uh, portfolio diversification. And Generally, someone who's in retirement, you know, hopefully has has already acquired significant amount of assets, right? So this is now the money you're going to be uh, living off of. So to gear a portfolio, to line it up to something that's too aggressive, and you know, like you said, maybe going individual stocks and picking just a handful of them, the risk is just too much there. You need to manage the risk. More importantly, when you're older and in yeah. re retirement than you are, so getting. Uh, a, uh, a fund that you can diversify that risk across various sectors, all paying dividends, for example, in the fund here. I'm actually going to highlight a different fund than you did, Brandon. And mm. the fund I'm going to look at is actually ZWC. And this is the BMO Canadian High Dividend Covered Call ETF. This fund has been around since 2017. So it's not one of the newer funds in the block. It's got a pretty good track record there. Management expense ratio is 0.72. It's almost the same fund that you I would use as a younger investor. Difference there is that it is uh, it, it employs an overlay of a covered call strategy. And so uh, I'm not going to get you know fully into covered calls, but essentially they take a portion of the portfolio and they write these calls on them. That means that they collect an income to you know stay out of the, the jargon, but they collect income into the portfolio. It does limit some of the upside potential on the growth side, but it definitely increases that cash flow and you're going to see a much higher yield typically on this type of fund than you would on an equivalent fund without that covered call overlay. If we look at the actual assets in the fund itself, the top 10 investments you can see on the screen here, um, obviously bigger Canadian companies, the banks, the utility companies, you'll see those there. From a portfolio asset allocation fund, about 40% of the fund is currently invested in financials. Then the second category is energy, 20% communication services at 10 and a half. And you can see so on down uh, the, the list there. Now, these are all sectors that do have a tendency to pay uh, you know, the, the more attractive dividends that you'd find in the new up to upcoming tech companies necessarily that wouldn't even be paying a dividend in the first place. I also want to just sort of expand on, you had talked, Brandon, during your segment there about the, the passive investment strategy. And for a younger person who doesn't have the time, maybe they're busy changing diapers and that type of thing to devote to actually managing uh, their portfolio. This offers that uh, the easy, the convenient way to gain that exposure. And, and heck, even though maybe someone who's retired you theoretically has more time on their hands, you know, hobbies, travel, a lot of other things might take you away from, from the desire even to sit in front of your computer all the time and, and uh, manage the portfolio. So this is a benefit there. Now, there are a few things that are characteristics that would be more specific to older advisors. So I want to cover a few of those um, off here. If we look at cash flow opportunities in retirement, for those people who are in or near retirement, that cash flow becomes way more critical uh, to, to an older person who, you know, the paycheck has stopped, maybe your other sources of income are gone. So this will provide that security, that, that's, you know, the dependability that you so uh, badly need. Also, I think you touched on this, but the types of companies that pay dividends are typically more stable. You know, they're less volatile, not always, but often they're, they're in that cap there. So from a capital preservation perspective, they're more suitable there. When the market's correct, typically we see, you know, the high flyers correct much more than these stalwart dividend payers. From a perspective of wealth preservation and growth, we talk about keeping pace with inflation. And so you're 60 or 65 and you retire, your income stops, well, inflation doesn't say, okay, I'm gonna take a break too here. Inflation continues to grow, right? So the types of companies historically that have paid dividends, you use the, the analogy of, you know, of rent income where it goes up every year. The cost of living is going up every year, so you're gonna need companies that are stable. And you know, some of these companies in this portfolio literally for 150 years, have been paying dividends, right? So, you know, the, the banks in, in the company here, in the country here. So you look for that balance of the income, but also still have the, the option, the availability for, for growth there. 
Um, tax efficiency. So tax is always important. But when you're uh, a pensioner, your income is sort of more predictable there. The fact that you might be collecting Canadian dividends as a Canadian investor, uh, depending on the type of account you're in, but those are taxed at a lower rate. So you get preferential tax treatment. You may have just lifestyle needs in retirement that you need extra cash flow for. You can get them. You can pull that cash flow in with a strict dividend fund, but adding that covered call overlay just will enhance that, the um, the cash flow that comes into your portfolio there. Things like uh, healthcare expenses that typically um, go over, you know, get go higher as you get older. Another thing too that um, from a capital preservation perspective, leaving a legacy. I, you know, uh, we probably haven't talked about this, Brandon, but you're probably not worried about leaving me something in your will. That's something you haven't got to that point yet. Whereas in my will, you know, yourself, your brother, that's something that's important to me that I leave something there. So having that reliable source of income and yet for allowing for the stability of the portfolio, uh, that's super important to, to an older person like me. So, you know, basically... A lot of the characteristics are the same, but the uses, the, the logic. So as an investor is going through your due diligence, you know, what are the things you need to consider? I think this sort of covers off for both generations, the things that you'd be looking for. There, there is definitely a lot of overlap, but like at least what I take mm. away from this is that almost, well, there are certainly some new, some different ones. Like, like you said, the tax efficiencies, these are things that, you know, for a younger person, probably less of a concern, but it almost seems like the older and older you get, the more of an emphasis you know, you put like there's more weight put onto some of these things. The benefits, you know, yeah. can be applied to people of all different age ranges. But for someone like you said in their 60s or 70s who is now relying on this, it just becomes more and more like you you tap into that that part of the the investment more. Uh, and I think, would you agree with that? Uh, I absolutely agree with that. In fact, I think that's, yeah. that kind of summarizes everything. Yeah, The characteristics may, may be the same, but they matter to me they a lot more than more they would matter exactly. to you. And it's, and sort of think, the, the, sorry. it's sort of the classic, like, I don't have that many years left to build up the reservoir. So if something bad happens today, um, well, I mean, I, I do want to enjoy my retirement. I don't want to put all of my money at risk. Whereas a younger person... You know, you know, on our channel, we always believe in having that core of the portfolio. I don't care if you're 20 or if you're 80, you still yeah. want to have that core. But just that you can afford uh, a little bit more volatility when you're younger. Absolutely. And I think that's one thing, too, to maybe just to cap off uh, the discussion mm. and kind of wrap, wrap things up, too, is that, like, you know, we, we hope to display today some of the considerations that either a young person or old person would have everybody's situation is different and their unique de needs and desires are different and as you progress through life and get closer and closer to the retirement stages and then let's say you know at the point where you're fully relying on your portfolio well you'll start to see that reliance that allocation almost start to skew heavier and heavier uh, and essentially re represent a bigger part of the portfolio as time goes on you're very well said and for example if, if we looked at your portfolio my portfolio we have a lot of the same companies that we own, but I would have a smaller proportion of the more aggressive ones and a larger Absolutely. proportion of the more stable ones, right? And of course, you know, well, at least my style, I, I don't have any of the higher risk ones. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so I think, uh, exactly. yeah, we're kind of covering it off there. Exactly. And hey, if you guys have questions, you know, like hopefully we did a good job of laying things out and explaining, do leave them down below. Um, if there's things that you're maybe unclear about or just want a little bit more more clarity on, um, highly encourage you guys to leave questions down below. Of course, there's like tons of details on, you know, if you go to BMO's website, which again will be linked down below as well, you can you can spend hours just looking at the stuff and uh, enjoying it. It's laid out in such, a, uh, such an easy, digestible way. But um, yeah, I think in that, with that said, we could wrap up the video. And like I said, if you guys enjoyed, um, please let us know by uh, giving a thumbs up uh, and leaving a comment down below. Maybe of the two picks, do you guys like uh, ZDV better? Uh, you know, that, which is, you know, would be the uh, the younger, a little more classic pick. <laughs> or do you like uh, the covered call option in ZWC? Um, I'm certain a lot of our viewers actually own these exact stocks. Like you said, they're some sure. of the most popular yeah. stocks in the Canadian market. But we'd love to hear your opinions on these down below. Um, and Dad... Good to see you. Good to see you again. It's you're supposed to you're supposed to be here right now, but I think there was some flight complications. Yeah, quick story. I was supposed to fly to see you, but the flight got canceled yeah. yesterday. Didn't get time, down time, so yeah, it's uh, didn't back happen. But back to Zoom. Back to Zoom, exactly. <laughs> so hey, yeah. Well, um, good to see you. Um, thank you for preparing uh, your aspect of this uh, video, and uh, I hope the viewers really enjoyed it. Let us know with a thumbs up. But as always, we thank you guys for watching. 
We hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you in the next video.